Um, we're having to learn how to do church in a little different way than what we're accustomed to. Normally, we have people in our sanctuary, and uh, we are ministering to our people in person, uh, but complying with uh, governmental orders now at this time of uh, what you want to call uh, quarantine. Uh, during this viral outbreak, um, we're just trying to comply, and it's a, it's a good order to comply with uh, that we don't see this uh, virus spread because they're telling us it's more contagious than what they had first thought. So we're just trying to work with it for a while. You know, sometimes people are asking about, you know, First Amendment rights and such, and, and this is always a concern. This is something we have to be very careful, be very diligent and vigilant uh, to keep an eye on. And But right now, the way we're looking at this whole thing, do we have a right to assemble? Yes, we do. But in compliance and out of love for our neighbor and, and concern for the spread of a, a public health situation, uh, we're just complying and go along with this. Now, it would be different if they were just saying no churches can gather, but everybody else can run their businesses, people can be at work. That's a whole different issue. Um, we pray it doesn't go there. Uh, but if it does, well, then I guess at that point, uh, decisions will have to be made. But meanwhile, we go along with everything, and we're just hoping that uh, those of you that are with us tonight that you're enjoying uh, your, your time at home. And uh, um, I know it's tough times for a lot of people, and and uh, very stressful times. And so uh, our big thing is that we lift this all up before the Lord daily in prayer and, and ask for his intervention. You know, God can lift this plague in a short time uh, if, if God's people will humble themselves and pray. He said he'd hear our prayer. Uh, if we come to him repentant, if we come to him willing to, uh, to put God in his proper place in our life, he promised that he'd hear us. Uh, that he would uh, hear the cry of the humble and he would heal our nation and heal our land, which includes your land, which includes my land. And so we serve a big God. And maybe this is a time where all of us are learning to draw a little closer to the Lord than we were before. I think of the words of James, a uh, little epistle in the New Testament. Uh, he said, if we'll draw near to God, God has promised then he'll draw near to us. And the Word of God tells us that He's not too far from any one of us. I always say it this way, that the Lord Jesus is as close as the mention of His name. God is after your heart. He's after my heart. He wants a relationship with every human being if they would just open their heart to Him. And we're not talking in a religious sense. We're talking in a relationship sense. Uh, we believe we serve a living God. We serve a risen Savior who is alive from the dead. Um, religion is man's attempt to reach God on his terms. The problem is, is God doesn't allow us to reach him through religion on our terms. But God has set forth the gospel, the good news. He sent a Savior 2,000 years ago uh, who was God in the flesh. Jesus Christ left he heaven, took on the, the form of earthly flesh, became a man, lived under the law of God, and obeyed it perfectly in thought, word, or deed right up to the end. And he became the sin offering for mankind. Um, not just for a few, not just for a few Christians. There's teaching out there today that tell us that Jesus only died for the Christian. No, he died for the sin of the whole world, which is my sin and your sin included. The beauty of that is, is that he loves all of us. He's willing none perish, but that all would come under repentance, that all would come to know him. God doesn't want to see, God does not delight in man losing his soul and dying for eternity without God. God has set forth the gospel, and Jesus came, took on earthly flesh, lived that perfect life, and became the sin offering, the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. And when he was crucified on Calvary's cross, on that Roman cross 2,000 years ago, he died as a sin offering for all sin, past, present, and future. And the Word of God says that upon his death, when they buried him, death couldn't hold him. And three days later, God raised him from the dead. He's alive from the dead. In fact, the Word of God even tells us by many infallible proofs, he proved his life. In fact, at the time of the resurrection, um, it's documented history that even on the streets of Israel, they saw some of the old prophets resurrected from the dead because Jesus Christ had liberated what was known as paradise at that time and took 
all the righteous dead that from, from uh, the time of Adam up to the time of the resurrection of Christ, they went to the paradise side of what we would say, we would call it hell into the lower parts of the earth, which at that time was divided into two parts. You had the comfort side and you had the suffering side, and there was a great chasm in between. Uh, they couldn't pass over one to another, but one side they were in comfort awaiting God's Messiah. And Jesus was God's Messiah. He had to pay the sin debt because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It took a savior. It took one greater than us, but he had to be a man. And that's where Jesus Christ came in. The true hero of my life is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who I came to know about 35 years ago in the fall of 1984. Um, I was a weekend alcoholic, drunk, profane, and I had found he had been dealing with my heart. Um, I was raised in a religion. I'll just leave that nameless at this time. But it was a mainline religion, Christian religion. Um, the knowledge was up here, but it wasn't here. It wasn't in my heart as it needed to be. Because when it gets into your heart, it'll change you. The Word of God is very clear that when we know the Lord and He's in us and we're in Him, we have a new heart and a new spirit. I love what it says uh, Paul, the apostle, said. I believe it's in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. It says, Now if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. And all things of old have passed away, and now all things have become new. And you're looking at a man who didn't like going to church back then. I, I had a religion in a sense. I did believe in the facts about Christ, the facts that he died and rose again. Um, I did believe those as far as historical history. But uh, I approached him through the way the denomination said you approach God, and it just was a modified religion. It was just behavior modification. Um, but when I found that I really needed him in the fall of 84, I found myself crying out to him that one night. And literally off the bar stool that Friday night in Fond du Lac, Bender's Tavern. You, I don't know if it's still there today, but I can take you to the place. Uh, I was miserable. My life was uh, just going to hell in a handbasket. I, I was empty. And I know I needed something, but I wasn't sure what I needed. And the Lord had been dealing with me. Um, at the time, I didn't know it was the Lord. But the Word of God is clear. No man comes to the Father but by the Spirit that draw him. And some of you I'm talking today, some of you know the Lord Jesus Christ. You're saved. You're, you're Spirit-filled. You know the Lord. Some of you are part of our church, our ministry. But maybe some of you tuned in tonight, and uh, maybe you got religion like I had. That's okay. That's where we're at. And, uh, and, but, you know, we can mistake that for real redemption, real salvation. And then maybe there's some of you that you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you claim to be atheistic. Maybe you claim to be a skeptic, an agnostic. Maybe you, you'd like to believe there's a God out there, but you, you've not been too impressed. And, and of course, what we, what we look at is we wonder how can a loving God, if he is who he says he is, and you know, allow all this stuff to go on in the world that we see. Well, there's a biblical answer for all of that, but I, we're not going to get into that at this moment. I want to back up a little bit, but that night that the Lord drew me, and I came off that bar stool, I went home that night, and I found myself just, just couldn't go on no more. And I found myself as a man, 25 years old, crying myself to sleep, but I found myself asking Christ into my heart because if he was there and there was a living God, I had to know. I had to know. I just couldn't go on this way. And the best thing I can tell you, not understanding how it all worked, but my heart was sincere. And my heart was repentant. And my heart was aimed towards God in heaven. And I knew his son, Jesus Christ, I was told for years, came to die for our sin. And upon asking him into my heart and life, I found myself falling asleep that night, but the next morning I got up, and I tell you, there, there was something had changed. I, a thousand pounds were off my shoulder. The colors in the room were bright. Um, I felt peace that I couldn't explain. Um, I felt joy. I, I felt alive and had no idea what really happened to me. And Immediately in my own heart and spirit, I knew by that Sunday what church I should go to. And it was a church where they, they loved the Lord and they, they would say hallelujah and praise the Lord. And, and uh, you know, the, the churches I used to make fun of, now I'm finding myself, I want to go see what this is all about. 
Well, as I begin to understand and go to church and read my Bible for the first time, and folks, prior to that time, I had never read anything. I, I just wasn't a reader. And, uh, but I found myself reading the Bible systematically for myself, and I started in the New Testament in the book of Matthew, and I just started reading every day until I got through the whole Bible. Well, as I begin to read, I begin to see things in Scripture that were confirming my experience that I had. And all of a sudden, I found myself, uh, you know, Jesus said, no man can come to the Father but by the Spirit that draw him. And I'm thinking, man, that's what happened in my life. I, I've, I'm on a bar stool. I, I'm, I'm hating life, hating myself, hate, just hating everything, feeling empty. And, but yet I'm feeling this, this, this draw towards God, and I, I didn't know what that was all about uh, until I found myself crying out to him. And when I responded to those dealings of the Holy Spirit in me, I found in Scripture that it confirmed that experience. Jesus even said in John chapter 3, uh, a religious man, his name was Nicodemus. He was part of the, the rulership of Israel. He was part of the spiritual leadership of Israel. We would look at him today as being a uh, denominational church leader, a great leader in, in what you would call the religious side of society. Uh, but yet yeah, Jesus had a word for him, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but he said, Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. You can't perceive it. You can't understand it. You really can't experience it until there's a new birth in your heart and in your life. And when I began to read those scriptures, they became alive to me, and I thought, that's my experience. I'm born again because through experience and by faith in Jesus Christ. And so as I begin to read the scripture, it confirmed my experience. And I'm just sharing this all with you today because maybe you're out there and maybe you've been, maybe you've, maybe you're in that place where I have been that many years ago. And maybe there's an emptiness in your heart. Maybe there's a, uh, you've been wondering about the things of God and maybe the Lord has been dealing with you. Maybe you're away from the Lord and backslidden, but it's a good time maybe now to come back to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so I just begin to find that as I begin to read scripture, it just confirmed the experience I had. And it's always been said this way, friend, that a man, a woman with an experience will never be at mercy to somebody that just has a mere argument. Religious people will argue this born again thing and they'll shun it. They, they got their religion. They do their thing. They do their, I call it their spiritual rain dance. They go to church. They put their time in. They do their thing and they just go out. But there's no change in their heart. There's nothing, they're, they're not God conscious, they're religious conscious, they, they, they want to be part of their local church, they try to do good deeds, but God doesn't accept us based on our performance, based upon the, the religious exercises we do. He, 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 he evaluates us based on our faith. And if we put faith in his provision of righteousness, and redemption, which is his son, Jesus Christ. You know, you'll read in the Gospels when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. You'll read there where when Jesus was in the water, John was baptizing him, they heard a voice from heaven. And that voice came out and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear you him. And so the heavens opened, the voice of God came from heaven, confirmed Christ as he was being baptized by John the Baptist that this is the one that men are to look to. He's the one men are to put faith in. I don't put faith in my church. I don't put faith in me. I don't put faith per se. I'm talking saving faith. We have faith in one another in, 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 practical, uh, in a practical sense, but I'm talking about for my eternity, my redemption, my spiritual life. And we put our faith in a risen Savior, one who died for us and rose again. And when men and women properly humble themselves before the, before the Lord and get down on their knees and from their heart, cry out to Jesus Christ, say, God, my Father, I just come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus. And Lord, I believe you died for me. And I believe you rose again from the dead. And I believe you're here to save me. And that I can find redemption and forgiveness of sin. And when you believe in your simple way, just the prayer, it does, it, the words aren't the, the most important thing, but it's, it's the heart. It's your heart condition. And you bring your mess, bring your sin. You come as you are. And you come before him. 
and you ask him into your heart and into your life. And he promised it, that he'd hear the prayer of the humble. And he'll come into your heart and he'll save you and give you a new heart and a new spirit. And he'll change you forever. And I guarantee you, you'll have a love for the Lord. You see, the new spiritual life in Christ is fueled and empowered by God, the Holy Spirit. The new heart, the new spirit, it, it comes with the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. He works a regeneration in you and me. It's called being saved. It's a big word, saved. And we hear that all the time. Uh, religious people like mocking that term. I'm saved. Saved from what? Saved from what? Saved. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm saved. And I've heard that a thousand times. But I'm here to say, when you've received him and you know he's come into your heart, you can't be talked out of it. Your life changes, and he becomes everything to you. He's the most important thing in your life is your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where we find the love of God for us, and it changes us, and we start to see the goodness of God in our life. For me personally, um, the desire for alcohol totally left. I, I, since the fall of 1984, a weekend alcoholic. I mean, I couldn't wait till the weekends, and I'd tie on a bender. It was my routine. And uh, very profane in my language, uh, but I, you know what? <laughs> when he saved me, I didn't change myself. He did that in me. And I didn't have that desire for alcohol no more. And I'm not condemning anybody that drinks alcohol or, or maybe has a struggle with it, but I know there's an answer, and I know there's hope for you, and you can't change your heart. I can't change my heart. To this day, I can't change me. And you can't change you. You can try new things, new lease on life. You can try your New Year's resolutions. We can improve our behavior here and there, but it's the heart. And Jesus said it's the heart that's man's trouble spot. And your heart needs to be redeemed. It needs to be changed. In fact, true salvation, friend, and I'll get into my scripture here in a moment, uh, but true salvation is a new heart and a new spirit wherein dwelleth righteousness. And that righteousness is Christ in you, the hope of glory. But he'll take those desires away. Uh, for me, the profanity left, uh, you know, I can honestly say since the fall of 84, I had to drop alcohol because I haven't wanted any. I just haven't wanted any. I don't have a desire for it. Um, profanity has left me. Um, you know, do I get mad? Do I, do I, do I <laughs> you know, I, for the... <laughs> Just no desire. That profaneness has, is gone, and it's swallowed up in the redemptive work of Christ. Now, I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of areas in my life that the Lord is still sanctifying me that needs a lot of attention. I like what one pastor friend of mine said one time. You know, he said the alcohol, the drugs, the fornication, the, the illicit activities, you know, when we get saved, you know, it seems that stuff drops off. Uh, and then he says, well, that was all the easy stuff. Now God goes to work on the hard stuff, was the, which is the development of our godly character. And uh, because until we are Christ-like, uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't let up on us. My wife and I were talking today even about my mother, uh, who was a born-again believer, loved the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, she passed away at the age of 66 of cancer. And I bring this up to our church often, but uh, to show you the, 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 how God works, that on her deathbed, few days before she had passed on she had told my wife and I she says he, she says you know and and she was in a weakened state she says God is still dealing with me that there's things in my heart that I need to repent of that I'm not that I need to get right he's still dealing with me about my condition and I thought wow that was profound but see God was preparing her for her eternity and I feel that God was dealing with her, that there were some things that she had to bring before him to get under the blood of Christ and uh, prior to her passing on. But it just shows you that the Lord is working in us to change us, to conform us every day into his image, to make us a little more Christ-like every day. And all of us are on that potter's wheel, and we're being formed and changed from day to day. And uh, that's a good news for the child of God. Anyway, I'm going to read to you a scripture tonight out of Second Chronicles of the Old Testament. We're looking at Solomon here tonight. And Solomon was the son of David and Bathsheba. He became the king after David, King David had passed away. And I'm just going to read a few verses here. But in verse 1 of chapter 6 of Second Chronicles, 
It says, then said Solomon, the Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness, but I have built a house of habitation for you and a place for thy dwelling forever. And the king turned his face and blessed the whole congregation of Israel and all of the congregation of Israel stood up. Verse 12. And then he stood before the altar of the Lord, speaking to Solomon, in the presence of all the congregation of Israel. And the Bible says he spread forth his hands, for Solomon had made a brazen scaffold of five cubits long, five cubits broad, and three cubits high, and set it in the midst of the court. And upon it he stood, and he kneeled down upon his knees before all the congregation of Israel. And he spread forth his hands towards heaven. And he said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven, nor in the earth, which keepeth covenant and which shows mercy to your servants that walk before you with all of their hearts. And with that tonight, I just want to talk to you a few minutes about the ignition or the igniting of the spiritual life, the igniting of the spiritual life. We all have a beginning in our true walk with the Lord and it's really not just a redemption, it is, an, it is an ignition. It's like turning the key and the power comes on and that thing is fired up. And that's really where the Lord, that's how he begins in us. He ignites our spiritual life. And we're going to talk about that for a few moments. But I want us to pray here tonight and ask for the Lord's blessing. Pray with me if you would. Father, we just come before you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for our live stream audience tonight, those that are gathered around listening to the word of God, listening to our testimony, Lord. And we're praying tonight, bless the live stream audience. There are many needs out there, many financial needs. There's physical needs, there's needs of healing, needs of, uh, there are people that, that need to come to saving knowledge of the Son of God. There are people that have conflicts in their family and in different situations, job situations. There's fears within and there's fears without. But, Lord, calm the storms. And we are asking, O oh God, for an intervention in our nation. Give our president and leadership wisdom and counsel how to handle the nation and how to set in order the affairs of this nation during this critical time. Lord, we are praying for the, for the, for the cure for this virus. We are praying, Lord, for your direct intervention, that you would just intervene divinely, Lord, and just lift this plague out of our land and out of the world. But use this, Lord, as a means to bring men and women to their need for you. And Lord, that out of this whole thing, Lord, that we can come to know the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anoint your word. Help me to teach and minister tonight as you would help us. So let us look tonight in the igniting of the spiritual life. The setting that we're reading tonight is when King David had passed on, his son Solomon was raised up by the Lord to be the next king in line after King David in Israel back in that time of history. Solomon was commissioned by the Lord and by his father to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. They tell us, historians will anyway, that when they built this temple, this temple was such a magnificent feat of ingenuity and, and architecture. They tell us that really very few of any structures today have been built as elaborate as Solomon's temple at that time. They tell us that if we would build and replicate that same temple to the exact specifications, use the same materials, they tell us in today's economy that temple would run $1.4 trillion dollars to build. I mean, that tells you how elaborate this temple was. And so a number of years had gone on and they finally completed the temple and it was time to dedicate the temple before the nation, before the people. And in this time, Solomon, who had a real tender heart before the Lord, um, gathers the people of Israel and they're going to have a building dedication. They're going to dedicate the temple. And what we have to understand about Old Testament Israel, and this is a whole other subject, but I'm just going to allude to it lightly. The sacrificial system that the Lord had set up from the Garden of Eden was, was progressing through Israel's and through the world's history. God was shown through these blood sacrifices. In fact, when you read your Old Testament, it's full of blood offerings, sacrifices, uh, brazen altars, altars of incense, all this, all this religious stuff that appeared religious. 
but it was God instituting this before man, showing man that one day his son was going to come and God was going to send forth his son that would become the final sin offering for all sin for all time. These were all pictures and shadows of what God was eventually going to do. So the mechanical ritual of all this was to keep it before people that to be right with God in heaven, man had to approach God through the blood sacrificial system, which pictured Jesus being the Lamb of God who would shed his blood for the forgiveness of all man's sins. He would become the atoning work that God would institute right from the Garden of Eden when God slew the two animals and covered Adam and Eve when they had rebelled against him and covered them and showing them that the way back to God is through the blood sacrificial system. So now we see in the time of Solomon this great, if you read these chapters, you're going to find that they are offering up thousands of animals and types of, it's a type of celebrating the redemption of God, the blood of Christ that was yet to come, and they're going to dedicate the temple. And now we find Solomon with thousands of people in the courtyard. He's on a scaffolding, probably about five, six feet high, and now here's the king, the leader over the whole land who has a heart for the Lord, and Solomon now is going to dedicate the temple, uh, not just to the Lord, but on behalf of the people. Now, this is so beautiful. At least this is what I see. Here we have the king in a humbled state. King Solomon being one of the greatest kings that, ever, that, this earth, that, that humanity ever produced is humble enough to get on his knees, to lift his hands before the God of heaven, to stand before the people and in a prayer of brokenness from his heart as he dedicates this temple to the Lord and to the people of Israel, here's this man not ashamed to be seen on his knees, not ashamed to be seen with his hands lifted high, but from his heart he begins to pray out of his heart. This was not a rehearsed prayer. He didn't have teleprompters in front of him. He wasn't reading a script. He didn't have a prayer book. This was out of his heart. And he begins to pray and dedicate this temple. In fact, if you would read this whole chapter of chapter 6 out of Second Chronicles, you're going to see, in fact, one of the things, every time Israel found themselves in trouble, Solomon was saying, oh God, as we dedicate this to you, if your people find themselves in trouble, if we find the enemy coming in, if we find plague, if we find uh, the trouble of our own heart and life, if we will just humble ourselves and but turn to you and call on the God of heaven, you would hear from heaven, you would hear our prayer, you would heal our land, and you would send blessing again. And over and over and over, you're seeing this. And so as I read this here tonight, I'm seeing that this is how the life of the nation should always be. You know, some of you may argue with this, but America was founded on the Judeo-Christian concept. I know in secular schools and colleges, they try to diminish that. They try to change the whole rewriting of history. But you can't get away from our founding fathers. These were men that had, some knew the Lord, some were heavily religious. But one thing they had a respect for was for the word of God. And they founded this nation on Christian principles. And if you look at our Constitution, you look at our We the People, you look at all of this, you can just see that this nation was found for liberty and justice for all. You can see that this nation was founded as a nation that would have religious freedom, that the government would not overburden, overtax the people, that people had a right to property ownership, private property ownership, that they could carve out a life without the tyranny of government and oppressive government. And I know they try to change all of that, but see, that was the principle by which our nation was founded. And this is where the life of the nation is going to get the blessing of the Lord. You look at our last 20, 30 years, what we've seen in our country, and the church is not where it needs to be. The true born-again believer uh, is not properly where they should be. Um, our secular part of uh, society has gone crazy as far as its lust. It wants anything and anything it wants and desires and doesn't care who it hurts. Um, you know, they tell us, uh, in the satanic church, believe it or not, it's not a church, but they, they call it that, um, their motto is, do as thou wilt. And we're kind of in a nation where every man's a law to himself, every man just does what he wants to do, no, no matter who it's going to hurt. But when you're founded on the word of God and the principles of scripture, 
you're going to love your neighbor as yourself. You're going to be concerned about what my actions do, how it's going to affect others around me. And I don't know about you, but I want a good life. I want a godly life. I thank God that his blessing is on my life, not because of anything I deserve, but because I've put my faith in God's provision of righteousness, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And God is not partial to any man, any woman. So whosoever will, the blessing of God can be on your life. And this is what we're reading in Solomon's time. He's dedicating the temple, telling God's people, the nation of Israel, how to have the goodness of God and the blessing of God in everything they do. And folks, if we'll just little by little, and it takes one at a time, one heart at a time, if we'll turn to the Lord and we'll examine our life and we'll realize that, you know, maybe there's some things that we've been allowing, things that we're doing, things that really wouldn't please the Lord. If I'll humble myself and I'll just say, Lord, I, I, that's not right and I, I want change. I, I, what this preacher is trying to tell me tonight, I hear what he's saying, but Lord, you're going to have to help me. And if we'll have that humble attitude and we'll approach God that way, he will hear from heaven. And he'll start drawing you to himself. And he'll start showing you the way because true spiritual life is a living thing. It's a living entity. It's not religion. It's alive. It's real. It lives in you. And I'm here to say, and this is what we read in Solomon's time, the ignition of the spiritual life began with leadership humbling themselves on their knees, lifting their hands before God and saying, oh God, you're God in heaven and earth. And begin to pray, not just for himself, but for the people of the nation. So as we look at Solomon's life here a little bit, we realize, I believe the need in the hour now is a great awakening in our church. Not just our church here locally, but the church, the body of Christ in our nation and around the world. I think of the words of the Apostle Paul. He would tell us, awake thou, thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. I think we're in a time where we need to arise. The church needs to awaken. Every believer in Christ needs to examine themselves, see whether we be in the faith. Make sure we're properly following the Lord, not through religion, but through a living relationship with the Son of God. You know, I, I share with our people here often, I, I start my day as much as I'm able. When I get up in the morning, I talk to the Lord. I begin to communicate, and prayer is talking to the Lord. Prayer isn't always this pr proper thing where you're just on your sent like this. Prayer is just talking to God, talking to Him. And I'll sit in my chair, I make my coffee, I take care of our, our, our dog, get them fed, or get him, her fed, and, and uh, then I get my Afghan, I sit on my couch, put my Bible on my, my lap, and then it's my time with the Lord. And uh, sometimes I only get a few minutes, sometimes I get an hour or two, depending on what time I get up in the morning, but... I find myself in the beginning of the day to acknowledge the Lord and I start talking to him and I, I come to him and I just start praising him, thanking him. I count my blessings. I try to name them one by one and I thank him for, for my, my lovely wife. I thank him for uh, our, our, our wonderful home. I thank you for the provision he's given us, the talents he's given us to, to make a living. I thank him for our church, the people of our church. I thank him for his savior. One of the greatest things I thank him for is, God, the work you're doing in me. Thank you for your redemption, Lord. Thank you that your work in sanctification. I thank you for loving me. <laughs> Believe that. Because uh, it's going to take God <laughs> to love us. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And uh, that he's patient with us and gracious with us. And, and then as time goes on, I start bringing other needs before him. And, and things will come into my heart. And I start praying for different people and search circumstances and situations that I find the Lord dealing with me on. And, and before you know it, your time goes by, and I'm enjoying talking to the Lord, and I sense his peace with me and his presence in my heart. And then after I talk to him for a while, then I'll systematically, I'll pick up right where I left off the day before, and I'll just start reading the Bible, and sometimes I'll get through a few verses, sometimes a couple chapters. And what you find is that many times what you're reading in the Bible uh, is confirming things that you're, that you're praying about, that you're, you're needing direction on, and a, and a Bible verse will light up for you. And all of a sudden you say, yeah, and you'll, you'll just know what that's about. And uh, it's like the Lord is communicating with you, talking with you. And so the beauty of that is, is you're being led by the Holy Spirit. You're, you're taking and lifting your burdens up before the Lord, and he's hearing you. And that's how our spiritual life is awakened, time with God 
talk to him. And then throughout your day, Paul said, pray without ceasing. That's not meaning you, you quit your job and you, you, you hide in a prayer closet and you just pray all day long. Um, I've heard those teachings from years ago, and that's a legalism. That's not the, how the Lord works. But it means in your heart, be in, be in touch with God, be in communication. I know throughout the, the day, uh, my lovely wife and I will, will communicate through the phone. She'll FaceTime me or we'll call each other, text each other. Uh, we enjoy each other's company, <laughs> the way a good marriage should, right? You know, and so, uh, but that's the way it should be with the Lord. You should be communicating with him, talking to him throughout your day. When something goes on, you should be saying, Lord, I need help. Give me grace here, I'm trying to figure out a problem throughout the day. Um, I do mechanical work, and sometimes uh, in mechanical work, uh, also do auto body work, I, I do trike conversions, motorcycle Harley trike conversions. That's our, our business, too. We do that. And we run into problems at times, very difficult problems, and how are we going to fix this? And so I'll ask the Lord what to do, and in a short time, I, all of a sudden I said, I never thought of that, and something comes to my mind, and, and I think that's all part of God first, putting him in your life, and God cares about every detail of your day. It doesn't matter if you're a stay-at-home mom and you're tending to the needs of your house. It doesn't matter if you're uh, a man uh, on the highest rank of, of civil duty and responsibility, the Lord wants to lead you, and he wants to be with you, and he wants you talking to him. And if you communicate with him, he said he'll hear you. And if he hears you, I'm telling him, you can talk to him. Tell him where it hurts. Tell him what you need. Tell him what you're struggling with. Tell him your battles. Tell him your woes. Tell him your disappointments. But tell him what you like to see. You know, God delights in giving his people the desires of their heart. And he'll give you those desires in your heart to desire for and that's what I found as a child of God is that many of the desires that he brings up um, are things that he just kind of starts putting in your heart and you go, yeah, I, I would like that. And then somehow, over time, he makes, brings that to pass. And it's just, it's awesome to see what he does. So just know that we serve a living God who, who's not trying to squash us under his thumb. He doesn't delight in judgment. He's not like when your dog makes a mess in the house and you got to rub his nose in it. People have that idea that God is just into judgment and he just can't wait for you to mess up and, and, and rub your nose in your failure. That, that's, that's not God our Father. Your God loves you. And he proved it by sending his son to die for your sin and to die for my sin. And upon receiving him, I want you to know you're an adopted son and daughter of God. You belong to him forever. And he delights in your prosperity. He delights in your advancement. He delights in improving the quality of your life. Now, don't get me wrong. There are hardships. There are people that die for their faith. And there are people that are heavily persecuted for their faith. But I like what it says at the end of the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, I believe, that whatever this life cheats you out, I'm talking about if you're a Christian, a child of God, whatever this life may cheat you out of, God will make it up to you in the resurrection, in the next life. Well, some people say, well, yeah, but I want it now. Well, unfortunately, we live in a world where nothing works like it should. But by the grace of God, he will give you a great life to live before him, a joyous life, a fulfilled life, and you'll find that your greatest joy and peace comes as you humble yourself before the Lord and serve him with all of your heart. So getting back to our text, Solomon was really laying the setting for a great awakening in the nation of Israel. In fact, if you read that chapter and go to chapter 7 in the beginning, after he dedicates the temple with his prayer, the word of God is very clear that God accepted his prayer and he proved it as the fire of heaven came down and consumed that sacrifice because remember, he's standing before the brazen altar. Now, let me share what that brazen altar is. Just I'm going to make it as simple as I can. That brazen altar in Old Testament Israel, part of the sacrificial system that God had instituted, every so often they were to put the sacrifice on there. And as the fires and the coals would burn that up, that sacrifice was a type of Christ that would one day come, that he would give his whole life as a ransom for many unto death. And as they put that offering on the brazen altar and it burned it up, the smoke of that went up to heaven, and God called that a sweet incense before the Lord. When Jesus died on the cross, and if you read Isaiah chapter 53, it said it delighted the Lord to put his son to grief. Not that he was getting into it, but that 
by the sacrifice of his son, willingly becoming the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world, God knew that through his death, burial, and resurrection that many would come into the kingdom of God and that Christ himself would be resurrected from the dead and that one day God could continue his plan that he had in the beginning because God does have a plan for mankind. And it's all going to be wrapped up in the Lord. Um, and so understand, Solomon is now standing before this brazen altar. We would understand that in today's terminology as like standing before the work of the cross, what Christ did on the cross for us by shedding his blood. He stood before a brazen altar. We stand before the cross. That's why Paul said we preach Christ in him crucified. We preach Christ and the cross preach Christ and what he did for us by shedding his blood on the cross. That's why we take Holy Communion as a remembrance of what he did at that brazen altar, spiritually speaking. He died for us on that cross of which the, the brazen altar was a type. Solomon standing before that brazen altar, humbled, standing with his hands or kneeling with his hands up before that brazen altar. It's a type of how the believer today kneels at the finished work of Christ I kneel every day, spiritually speaking again, before the Lord Jesus Christ and his great atoning work by shedding his blood for me. I always say it this way. Jesus Christ died on the cross for the personal condition of our personal sin. And we personally receive him personally into our heart for our personal condition. And he becomes our personal savior, our personal redeemer. And he is your closest friend, I'm telling you. You'll come to know him, and you'll know he lives in your heart uh, when you properly received him and believe upon him. So Solomon here, kneeling down before the brazen altar, is a type of you and I who have to humble ourselves before God. You know, it's been said, how do we get to God the Father? Well, first of all, to get to God, you've got to go through the cross. No man comes to the Father but by the Spirit that draw him, but yet he has to come through the Son of God. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Not me, not the Pope, not your church, not my church, not my, uh, my pastor, your pastor. There's one man who went to Calvary, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. And the word is clear. There is no mediator between God and man, but Jesus Christ. And so understand that today. That's the word of God. And that's strong, but that's the word of God. And so he's the savior. He's the mediator. But to get to him, you, we have to humble ourselves like Solomon is here. Kneel down spiritually. That's called humbling ourselves. That means not playing games with God, not breaking into the door and saying, well, God, here I am. And, you know, aren't you glad I'm here today? No, 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 no. No, that, that haughtiness doesn't go nowhere with the Lord. Men got to come to a brokenness. Men have to hear the gospel. Men have to come under conviction for their sin and their condition. It, I know this, and I'm going to say this quickly, but God began dealing with me heavily about the age of 15, and I rejected the dealings of God then. Well, my life spun out of control for 10 years, and at the age of 25, God finally allowed life to have its way and, and, and to bring me to that point where I was ready and I was ready to humble myself. And if God was out there, I was as low as I can be. It's been said, friend, that it's hard to get a man or a woman to serve the Lord when everything's going their way. Until you and I see our need for a Savior, you'll never need him. You'll never desire him. Religion will suffice you. It'll do, it'll do just fine. But you're going to find one day that there's no life in that. And it leaves you empty and unchanged. And there's no help from God. And I'm here to say, when men humble themselves and look to the Savior, God's provision of righteousness and redemption. And God only has one, one mediator between God and man. His name is Jesus Christ. And if you humble yourself before him and realize that Jesus Christ isn't a curse word. He's a Savior. He's God's savior god's provision to you and to me for our redemption and when you humble yourself before him and you're ready and folks i know many of you listening tonight some of you've been you've crossed that river already you know exactly what i'm talking about you've received him some of you are religious as i said earlier and you're pondering what i'm saying and maybe i'm making you mad maybe i'm making you glad but then there's some of you listening that, yeah, maybe, maybe there's a little bit of a scoffing there and you just feel like, uh, what, what are you trying to say? I don't believe all that. Well, that's fine. 
because I was there one day too. At the age of 15, I made mockery of the church. I made mockery of born-again people. I laughed at them. They were the brunt of my jokes at times. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you, I was, uh, I was raised with a, a, a preacher's son, in a sense, uh, and it was unbelievable the things that I would hear him say and the things that I would join in and say with him in mockery of the things of God. But I'm here to say I'm ashamed of that today, but I'm thankful that he loved me in spite of me. And he loves you in spite of you. And he's not done working in you. And he's going to keep doing a work because he'll come past heaven and earth by God the Holy Spirit. They call him the hound of heaven. He's going to find you one day, friend. And when you're in that place, I had somebody tell me one time, Jeff, when you hit your lowest, just cry out to Jesus. I never knew what that meant until it was time and I knew what it meant then. Prior to that time, I thought I'm just as saved as you. And even though this person was a born-again Christian, um, I, I kind of mocked at it and scoffed at it. Uh, but the Lord has a way of breaking us down. Even King Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament, a heathen king, the Bible said that this man thought that all this great work of his kingdom was all because of his great abilities. Well, the Lord humbled him, and for seven years, he lost his mind. You can read the story in the book of Daniel. And he was driven into the field and out into the pastures, and he ate, he ate grass like an ox. He, his hair and everything, he grew like an animal. Until about seven years, he came to his senses. It took seven years for this man's pride to be humbled. And at the end, when God restored him to his kingdom... And he came back to his right mind. He made a statement. He said, those that are lifted up in pride, God is able to abase. And I have to ask a question tonight. We're reading about Solomon tonight, dedicating the nation to the Lord, dedicating the work of God uh, into its proper place, into the hearts of the people of Israel. But I have to wonder, is God humbling us? Is God bringing every man, boy, girl, and woman in this nation? We've never seen a plague like this affect us in our lifetimes. We don't know how it's all going to turn out in the end. Um, the numbers are staggering that if they're fearing if this goes on, there could be a couple hundred thousand people uh, die from this uh, virus before this thing lifts. We don't know. Nobody knows yet. It's affecting everybody, but I wonder if God is using this. He's not the cause of it per se. I believe that he, but he uses these things to deal with the hearts of men. And I have to wonder, is, is, is God trying to humble this nation because he loves the, the people of the, he loves the people of the whole world. We're, we're not no special, nobody special beyond anybody else. The difference is our nation was founded on his principles and the word of God. But God has a people, and he always will work with that people. But God is trying to get the attention of not just us, but this world. In fact, there's even some scriptures in the Old Testament that God talks about that he's going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. He's going to get the attention of mankind. We know, according to scripture, one day there's going to be a seven-day great tribulation coming. Um, but is God getting our attention now? Is God trying to bring an awakening? I believe with all my heart, God is trying to ignite the spiritual life of not just you, but his church, his people, and maybe many that don't know him. God wants to ignite our spiritual life. And in this ignition of our spiritual life, you're going to change for the better because you're going to find that God is there now. And you're going to find everything about you change for the better because Jesus Christ loves us too much to leave us the way we are. And thank God for that. So Solomon is the king, son of King David and Bathsheba, dedicates the temple, dedicates the work of God, dedicates the nation, and lets them know, and I want to challenge you, read the second chapter, or I'm sorry, the sixth chapter of Second Chronicles, and you're going to find some interesting things there, and there's some promises in there for you. You're going to find a situation, he says, if the people are put to the worst, if the people are going through this, if a man finds himself this way, he gives the answer how to come out of that, how to see the Lord turn things around for them. And I'm going to challenge you to read it for yourself, and I believe the Lord will speak to you out of there and give you some hope in this very difficult time. And so I want to see you take some time in the Word of God and see if it makes a difference in your life. I want to tell you something, too, before I close here tonight. we got a few minutes here. The Word of God tells us very clear. But to this man will I look, 
Now, this is the words of the Lord himself. Even to him that is of a poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. There needs to be more trembling before the word of God. And what does it mean to tremble? It means to take it serious. It means to stop playing games with God. It means stop playing Russian roulette with your life. It means to let the Lord put his hand on sin issues that need to be dealt with, that need to be put under the blood of Christ, and to come clean before God. And if we become, if come clean before God, we'll be clean before men. And so there needs to be a change. God is in the righteousness. He's in the holiness. He's in the purity. He's in the truth. And as a child of God, this is his work in us is to conform us into the image of Christ. You know, we make this mistake. We compare ourselves by ourselves all the time. The Apostle Paul said, that's not smart. You don't do that. Compare yourself to Jesus Christ, and then you'll see your great need. When I look at other brothers and sisters, I might think of myself, well, I'm not doing too bad because I see the struggles they're having. I see the hypocrisy over there. I see, you know, so I feel pretty good about myself. Paul said, you're foolish for doing that. And I used to do that, believe it or not, until I learned the principle that, no, God is comparing us to his son. How are you compared to Jesus Christ? If you watch my life or I watch you, are we going to see Christ in you? Are you going to see Christ in me? I hope so, but I know I've got a long ways to go. And if you're honest, you've got a long ways to go. But that's part of his grace and development. But I want to tell you this. If we'll humble ourselves, like we said tonight, who does God look to? Those that are of a poor and contrite spirit. Those that are broken before the Lord. Those that see their need for God. Those that aren't going to play games with God, or uh, play games with God, but they, they mean business with God. And if we mean business with God, he'll hear us. And tremble at his word. In other words, if it's in the book... I want it in my life. If, it's, if God says, stay away from this, I don't want that in my life. But I realize that he's got to help sift those desires out of me and do the work of grace in me. And that's the beauty about true Christianity. It's this beauty of God working by his grace in your inward man, in your inward heart, changing you and me from the inside out. And so that's why uh, uh, resolutions don't work per se. Good desires don't work per se. Because you can't change yourself. I can't change myself. The word of God says, can a leopard change his spots? No. But Jesus can change us. So as we close here tonight, as a believer by faith, if I'm positioned before Calvary, put my life before Christ and him crucified for me, what can I look to? First of all, Paul said, I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified and everything the believer needs as Solomon was presenting this before the people of Israel as he was dedicating the temple, kneeling before the brazen altar, a type of the work of Christ. Now in 2020, what do we do? We humble ourselves before the Lord by faith we go to the cross by faith. We look to that shed blood for us. We believe on, his save, on God's Savior, Jesus Christ, and Jesus takes us to God the Father. And I've always said it this way. You don't get God the Father without God the Son, and you don't get God the Son without coming to the cross, acknowledging his blood shed for you. So as far as the benefit of the cross, what do I receive? What is Israel going to receive? The goodness of God. Do you realize tonight that everything God has for you came through the cross? And I want you to understand something. Your salvation comes through the cross. Your victory in life, your victory over sin comes through the finished work of Christ. The blessing of God that's available to you and I as children of God comes through the cross. Divine healing. If you need a healing, you can call on the name of the Lord. That comes through the cross the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit comes into your life by your faith in a finished work. That all comes through Calvary. The grace of God comes to you through Calvary, through the cross. You need grace. I need grace. We need grace for living. We need power. And that comes through the cross. Everything Christ has for you comes through the cross. Fulfillment of heart, fulfillment of life, answered prayer, the goodness of God. Uh, everything he has comes through Calvary's cross, the conversion of your heart, the conversion of your spirit, justification by faith, sanctification, which is the ongoing development of Christ-likeness in our life, uh, the rewards of eternal life. Everything comes to you, the believer, through what your Savior did personally for you on the cross 2,000 years ago. And folks, that's what we get when we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We need an ignition 
of our spiritual life. And that'll come as we humble ourselves, as Solomon did of old, spiritually speaking, and maybe even physically. Some of us just need to get on our knees and mean business with God, and he'll mean business with you. The Lord bless you tonight. Thank you for being with us. Remember, 10 a.m. Sunday morning, come back to this same uh, uh, source of broadcast. And hopefully by that time, it'll be linked to our website that you can click the live stream button. But meanwhile, we're kind of having to let people know where the broadcast can be found. Uh, let us know the quality of the broadcast, the picture quality. We're working with a new company and uh, we're hoping our live stream has improved. And so we'd like to hear from you anyway. We're on Facebook, YouTube, live, um, our website, the church email address. Um, so uh, just let us know how everything is going. And if you need prayer, I want you to send us a note. We want to hear from you, and we'll pray over your need. And so let us hear from you any way that you can get a touch with us. There's different sources. But otherwise, come and visit us again this Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. And we'll have another live stream broadcast. And until we can gather again as a body, as a church, uh, we'll be doing this live streaming. But the Lord be with you. And we're going to close in prayer. And as we do, uh, we'll be signing off. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just so thank you for those that have tuned in tonight. I pray, O oh God, that those that heard our word tonight, heard the ministry of the word of God, Lord, that you're dealing with them, that you're drawing them to yourself. We have no interest to bring people to ourselves. We're not here to exalt ourselves or our own ministry, but we are here to lift up the name of the Son of God, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who loved us and died for us and gave himself for us 2,000 years ago. Oh, that men would come to know you, that men would come to the saving knowledge of the Son of God. And Lord, it's our prayer to remember your people, but as we call upon the Lord, answer them speedily. Send peace, Lord, in this time of storm. And Lord Jesus, draw thousands by your spirit. And again, lift this plague from off our nation. The Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The Lord Jesus bless you. We will see you this coming Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Good night and God bless.